It took from morning until midday for Peter and Angelina to climb down from the hidden mountain lake, the breezes governing them as they gently flew down the slope, through the alpine fields of heather, and returned to the village. We have joy and happiness, a double treasure, said Angelina, happiness being our wealth of contentment. That's a good definition, answered Peter, for happiness is defined as the state of being content with what you have. And of reveling in the moment. That's what we have right now. We have joy and happiness, a double treasure, said Angelina, happiness being our wealth of contentment. That's a good definition, answered Peter, for happiness is defined as the state of being content with what you have. And of reveling in the moment. That's what we have right now. And appreciating our very existence and love. And our good health, all with gratitude. And every other good, stable, and smooth thing that the brain ordinarily filters out when the scene is unchanging. Unchangingly wonderful. But you're right. The brain, allowed to go its own way due to the old fight-or-flight response, usually only takes note of what's changing, hurting, or bad. But we don't let that happen. No, we have gratitude and appreciation for all that we give to each other. And we're thankful for life and for all of our senses. Reaching town, Peter and Angelina sat down to brunch at an outdoor cafe. Angelina having quiche and Peter having chicken and shrimp over linguine. This was one of many long, warm summers spent in the cool sandstone farmhouse that sheltered them in the dark shade of the pines, which also served to block the wind in the winter. And so it was that several years passed for Peter and Angelina, during which they continued to build on their relationship, always keeping it new and interesting. Exciting and serene at the same time. Sounds exciting. It's so we can float down the creek and row through the ponds and on toward the town, lake, and beach. Well, I guess I could have known that. I am surprised. A two-person inflatable boat with oars. What's that? asked Peter. One day Peter arrived at their farmhouse and found a boat in their bed and Angelina sitting in the boat. It was a small boat, and they fit snugly into it, sitting face to face, their legs crossing and barely allowing for the oars to pass over. However, the relaxing sensations from floating made up for any small inconveniences of comfort as they rowed forth from the town dock, where an old fisherman looked at them and thereby remembered his youth. Sometimes they'd use the oars, but often they'd just float on the river tide that pushed up the inlet. Boating was like the weightless feeling that comes just after making love, that effortless gliding in the aura of spirituality and sensuality. They found a creek feeding the inlet and drifted up it amidst jungle like bird cries and imaginary alligators. Later they crossed the channel to a nature sanctuary and disembarked there into the woods for kisses and privacies, which were never chronicled in their journals, for this was never land. And therein the adventures remained, but we can surely imagine it by now. We've been together many years now, Peter. Happy anniversary. We've always kept our relationship new. S1, thanks, we've done well. And always kept it full of new adventures like the boat. We still focus on the good things, even the littlest things. Whereas later on in their relationships, some couples only focus in on the bad, especially the little trivial things. We've never said anything to each other that couldn't have been said on a honeymoon. And so our liaison has been one continuing honeymoon. Peter and Angelina had been walking the Appalachian Trail throughout a perfect autumn alone together in the woods, much as they had been long ago at the beginning of this epic. I have never seen a bluer sky than that of October's, remarked Peter. Perhaps it is because of the cool dry air. The vision is but enhanced by the foreground of the colorful orange tree leaves. This is the last true blue that we shall see for some time. It's only fitting that it be the best of times, the bluest of times. Following the harvest, 
The moon was still a strange sight at 11 a.m. setting in the west, quite a large chunk missing from its battered orb. Also, there was the sun well risen in the east, seeming to balance the moon as its echo. The duo made their way through a lonely upland wild and still, where October's last zephyrs whispered at will, as if they were praying for the souls of the dead. Towards evening on a November's day, the first quarter moon rose very early, sitting atop the evening star, but then rose later and later each day, drawing away from Venus and thereby adding light to its own face. No leaves, no warmth, no sky, no snow, November. November is a more difficult time. The glory of the summer and of the leaves is gone, and it seems like it has been gone for years, but the spirit of the holiday season is not yet at hand. The gray and rainy skies are a stark contrast to the dry blue skies of October. There is no snow yet for winter sports and the land remains barren. The land is dead, and the very year itself continues to die in the night. The day is so short that when one gets home for dinner it already seems time for bed. Time for hibernation, perhaps. To these feelings add the specter of a long, drawn-out winter. Now we even long for February. Come December we wake a little, when auroras will set fire to the polar heavens to give color to our lives during the festival of the Yule. The storm is long gone and is just a memory now. The day, though nearly over now, is bright near its end. Helios has warmed our hearts. Twilight now welcomes all, twilight. That magical hour after sunset, when people love to stroll the village square. The second summer was warm but brief this year and some weeks passed. The now chill winds hastened the couple's approach to the nearest inn. The twosome looked at the rising omen of winter in the very late night sky. Orion, king of the bejeweled winter sky, backbone of our nights, said Peter. Wield your sword above our heads, but please never below. There in the road ahead, a huge yellow beast lay dead ahead and was growing larger by the second. Right in front of their eyes did it lie. It was, of course, the moon. I think that the November frost moon is even more impressive than that of the harvest. It is so colorful and intimidating. The moon rose straight into a thunderhead as an old lady opened the door of the inn. Tit for tat, she said as she farted at the thunder. Christmas came and went at the inn, hardly making a dent in the already festive atmosphere. However, the stone walls and withered gates of the inn had warmed with the festival of the Yule, the baker's cakes, the rituals of the Druids, and the cutting of the sacred mistletoe from the chosen oak. Lazy winter days turned into weeks.